Okay, so uh, I'm sort of the wrap-up or sweeper talk uh, on isotopes. So if you don't like isotopes, it's all over in a half hour. Um, <laughs> but I'd really like to um, think about you know the presentations over the last um, day and a half and the things that have struck me and that I would like um, all of us to think about during this are um, three things. One, um, starting with Mikkel's talk, this idea of ecometrics in uh, fauna. Uh, and the other is, that was brought up by uh, Matt Sponheimer, is this idea of ecological interaction. Um, and uh, the third is the, the sort of resolution in time and space scales, of what we can say with enamel isotopes or wh whatever other proxy it is. Um, so the title of my talk is Straight from the Horse's Mouth. Uh, that's actually an elephant mouth, for those of you who are not into paleontology. Um, this is a horse tooth, and this is a um, extant hippo tusk from Kubifora, Kenya. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Peter and the other co-conveners of the conference, as well as my co-authors, uh, my advisor Turi, who um, provided me with the opportunity to work on this project, and has been a great advisor thus far. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm trying to finish, so <laughs> hold his feet to the fire. Uh, and then uh, John Harris and me Vleeke, who uh, did a lot of work at Lothigam with Turi uh, in the early 90s, which I drew on. And then uh, the Japanese team, uh, Yutaka Kunimatsu, uh, Masato Nakatsukasa, and Hideo Nakaya, who invited me to um, Nakali to work there and had um, provided access to the collection at the National Museum of Kenya. So I'm going to talk about carbon and oxygen isotopes and enamel. Uh, Naomi's done a great job explaining this, so I won't get into it too much. Uh, if you missed it yesterday, I'll provide a very short slide for that. Um, and so here we go. Um, so I'm talking about mostly stuff from 10 to 5 million years. Um, so I thought I'd start with a 4 to 0 million year slide and say that as limited as this is, as different speakers have pointed out, this is still really, really great record that we can tie to the, the hominid tree here. Um, is animated, and the image is gone. Well, um, this is supposed to be Sarah's data here. Uh, <laughs> and what I wanted to show in this box, so this box represents um, 10 to 3 million years. And you may or may not recall from her, uh, <laughs> uh, but the point is, it's not extremely important. Um, but the point is, <laughs> there's, there, there's just, Sorry, Sarah, I didn't mean it that way. My point with respect to this slide was simply that we don't have a lot of, uh, this would be so a carbonate data over here, um, from this sort of 10 to 5 million year window. And so uh, one of my recommendations would be we need to really start filling in the gaps with so carbonates, uh, biomarkers, and um, I guess the pollen if, if we can find it. And the limitation to that is there aren't a lot of these late Miocene sites between, say, um, 10 or 11 million years up to, to 5. So there's a challenge there. Um, today I'm going to discuss data from three sites uh, in the Turkana Basin in Seguda Valley. Um, I'll start down here at Nakali, um, show data from the Samburu Hills, and then um, Lothagam. And uh, just to put the um, 231 core in a context, it's about 1,700 kilometers away. And so this gets into the issue of this is a really excellent regional recorder, and we're moving into these three sites. Um, which are on the ground um, higher resolution recorders. Uh, this is the stratigraphy uh, of the three different areas. The important thing to take away is the ages in red. So in Nikali, we use an age of 9.9 .9 million years. Um, and I'll show uh, data from the uppermost part of the lower member uh, here. And then a lot of the fauna comes from the upper member of the Nikali formation. Uh, and then we move to the Samburu Hills, and the fauna comes from the, the Nemerungule formation, um, dated at 9.6 in the lower member, and with Paleomag, it's about 9.3 for the upper member. Uh, and then we zoom up to Lothagum, where we have a much longer record spanning from 7.4 to, we've got a few things from the Kayumung, so about 3.2 million years. And I'm going to show this all in time slices. Um, um, and first, this is just the enamel slide. Um, We've got this great separation in carbon between C3 plants and C4 grasses. There's this 14 per mil enrichment that we use for all um, samples. 
So that in enamel isotope space, um, a C3 diet, I use a cutoff of minus 8 for a C3 dominated diet. Anything in between is mixed. And then at minus 2, I, I call it a, a C4 dominated diet. OK, so these are histograms with uh, carbon isotope ratio on the x-axis and number of individuals on the y. Um, at each site, we have between eight or nine uh, herbivore families. Um, the age is listed here, millions of years, and the number of specimens is here. And again, this light box is a C3 dominated diet. White is mixed, and the darker gray is a C4 dominated diet. And I'm going to start with Nikali and actually dig into this site a little bit more once I get through here. Um, but this is a, a really interesting site in East Africa because there's essentially no C4 consumers except for a few mixed feeders and, and three very odd equids out here. But um, you know, about almost 100 samples are sitting here in C3 space. <coughs> and we move forward to the Namurungale, and this is the first sort of bimodal distribution we see in the record um, with both C3 and C4 consumers. Uh, this probably holds into the upper member. We just don't have as many numbers to resolve the distribution well. Um, but so this is the first big shift from here to here. And then this bimodal pattern holds through the lower Nawata at Lothagen. And then again, this is another big shift between 7.4 and 6.5 million years, where now we have uh, C4 dominated um, diets uh, in the majority of the fauna. And that gets pushed even further to the right uh, as we move younger. OK, so taking the, the Nikali histogram, we can break it down. This is a box plot with carbon on the x. Um, and we have eight different families. And now you can see who's responsible for what at this site. And nearly everyone is over here in, in the C3 diet space, uh, except for a handful of equids. There's these three uh, that I analyzed many, many times to make sure I wasn't crazy. Um, some of the gonfotheres have a little bit of C4 in their diet, potentially, and, and a single rhino uh, and a suet. But the majority of the fauna is in this C3 space. So this is a really powerful tool for reconstructing a landscape. Um, I feel pretty comfortable here saying this is not a C4 grassland. Okay. Um, we, for about a little more than half of the samples, um, we can put them either in the upper or the lower member. Um, and so I've done that. Green is the lower member. Yellow is the upper. Um, and in carbon, it actually turns out that all of the lower member stuff is basically C3. And we don't see C4 until the upper member. So even though we don't have age control to say you know, this is 100,000 years or 200,000 years or 100 years, we do know that there is some evidence for, for landscape change uh, between the, the lower and the upper member. If we add into that the oxygen isotope data, uh, it's a little ambiguous, but it looks like there are slightly more positive values um, coming from the upper member. So this is the kind of thing we can do with carbon and oxygen at good, at high resolution scale. OK, so now I'm going to move into looking at um, particular lineages across time through this window of about 10 million years to, to 4 million years. Um, and probably the most um, characteristic changes in the equids. And, and I'll note, we've got all the taxa here. Um, and for the first three time slices at Nikali and the Samburu Hills, we're dealing, we think, with the same species as the Cormo hipparian. Um, and so this is all change within a single uh, species. And here we've got about 35 equids from Nikali. Again, like 25 are sitting in here, and uh, the other 10 are here. And then by the time we get 9 to 9.6 million years, there's no longer any equids in this, this sort of C3 diet space. And then again, it shifts as we move into the upper member. And by the time of the lower Nawata, it's 7.4 million years, we essentially have um, dedicated C4 grazers. And we were so confident, well, we just didn't sample out here. Um, <laughs> and, and I should mention on all these plots, uh, these are extant herbivores of the same family. So these are zebras. Um, and they're all from northern Kenya. So. <clears throat> and they're corrected by one and a half per mil for atmospheric CO2 changes recently. OK, so I guess the question here, and, and uh, this really uh, needs to be addressed because of the, the data that Sarah just presented, that we have good evidence in the pollen record for expansive um, C3 grasses, <clears throat> or at least making up a, a high percentage of the pollen record um, in, the, in the 231 core. So, um, we're stuck with this question here. 
was this uh, particular equid transitioning from C3 browse to C4 grass, or was it going from C3 grazing to um, C4 grazing? Uh, and, oh boy. So this is a, was a figure of uh, mesoware, but you just have to think back to uh, Mikkel Fortelius' slide, where if you were here yesterday, there was um, the um, moose tooth, which had sharp cusps and high relief, very jagged, good for browsing. And then he had a, a horse tooth, which was high crown, but had very low occlusal relief. It was kind of flat and was great for eating grass. And so um, a, a semi-quantitative method has been developed where you can measure the occlusal relief and the cusp shape. So if it's high relief and sharp, then you've probably got a browser on your hands. And if it's low relief and flat, it's more indicative of a grazing diet. So um, my colleague, uh, Hideo Nakaya did this on a series of upper molars from uh, the equids at Nakali and in the Namurungale. This is the number of teeth. And this is from the, the fourth premolar back to the, the third molar. So we can work on any of these teeth and measure these things. Uh, and up here we have the occlusal relief. Um, and there's a high, high percentage of high occlusal relief from the Nakali equids. Um, and a lower uh, percentage from the <coughs> Namurungale equids. This is 182 extant zebras, which we know are grazers, as the comparison. Uh, and then if we move down to cusp shape, you know, we've got a um, pretty similar percentage of blunt cusp shapes. Um, and although these are similar, sharp and sharp, I don't, I'm not exactly sure how to interpret this, but I, I think this is pretty good evidence that, that there was some uh, browsing going on with these Nakali equids if we just compare it to the, the modern and, and the differences between these two. That, that's just answer A. Answer B, um, again, this is Sarah's great figure, which is probably hopefully seared in your minds. But uh, <laughs> what I would point out here is this uh, decrease in, in, in pollen. Um, <clears throat> but, but out here at the base of her record, we saw, um, I don't know, Sarah, 40%. Um, of the total pollen was grasses. So this gets at, um, you know, here's two, two different records of different scales. You know, this is an ecometric that's from the horses that were eating uh, the biomass that we analyze the isotopes on. So, you know, I feel pretty confident in this, but we also have to consider this and say, well, you know, we can, we can reconcile this easily by saying there's environmental variability, I think. Okay, uh, another interesting group is the, the gomphotheres and elephantids. Um, they are mostly uh, in the C3 diet space here early on. Um, you know, we've got this gap of almost two million years and there's just nothing we can do about it yet because we haven't found sediments, fossiliferous sediments, um, to fill this gap. Um, but very quickly they move into C4 dominated diets um, in the lower Nawata and then here, they're all occupying a very narrow diet space and this is, I think, the most interesting here. It's collapsed to a, a fairly narrow range. Um, and I've shown there's about four or five different species here. But if you look in the, the published um, uh, faunal tables, there's actually eight species of either gomphotheres or elephantids here. So it's the highest diversity of these uh, proboscideans, denotheres excluded, in the entire record at Lothagem. But we have the most um, sort of collapsed or narrow dietary niche. So it's, it's an interesting ecological turn um, to have so many species that are competing for each other in a very narrow um, dietary niche. And I guess this is an important thing that they've now gone back to browsing recently. Um, and one of the things Terry and I were discussing the other day was, well, the denotheres are gone and they were uh, known browsers throughout their record. So could it be that maybe that the absence of them opened up the niche for, for the elephants to return to. But that's pure speculation. Um, and this is just to show, getting back to this idea of ecometrics, um, that um, both the horses and the elephants um, and the gomphotheres were, were set up to start grazing in a sense. Um, this is change in, in tooth morphology from um, 15 million years to present. And I've shown a couple of samples here um, that we've worked on. And so we've increased the crown height between 10 million years and, and today. Um, and then the, the complexity and the thickness of the molar surface, the occlusal surface, has also increased 
um, toward, this is a tooth that is designed to graze. And as John Harris pointed out to me, he said, well, even if they go back to browsing, why would the tooth change? So this is, to me, sort of a one directional shift. If you develop hypsodonty, um, that doesn't preclude you from browsing in the future. All right, and the last case that I'll show in detail is, is the suids. Um, and the suids have this rather delayed response um, until they actually start to have C4 dominated diets at about six and a half million years. So that's a full nearly uh, two and a half, three million years after we see it in the equids. Um, and then, but they actually go all the way. This is, these are northern Kenya. We know suids do a lot more things in other places. But um, there's this very long delayed response. So I'm going to, oh, and then these guys, are, these are our known browsers throughout the record, um, the giraffids and the dinotheres, and they're sort of doing the thing mostly in, in C3 space throughout time. OK, so this is uh, some other families that I haven't discussed, mainly because uh, the bobbins taxonomically are quite difficult because of their diversity, so it's hard to say much. Um, but I will point out a few things here and, and frame what I hope could be a discussion question. Um, but first, on the left, we have the two sort of first responders. The rhinos are having a C4 dominated diet by 9.6 million years. The equids are slightly earlier. And these are both perissodactyls, so um, hindgut fermenters. The, the elephants, you could argue, have closer to a hindgut <coughs> fermentation than they certainly don't have a foregut fermentation. Um, and so these all were the early responders and the perissodactyls. Um, but the big question is, um, how do we interpret these enamel isotope records um, as a response to some forcing? So in one example is Sarah has shown quite clearly there's a C4 expansion um, early on from about 11 to 9 million years. Um, and if we chose the suids as our responder, we would say, well, it didn't really affect them very much. If we chose the equids, we would say, wow, that, yeah, th that signal was very important ecologically for, for the equids. And I think um, this can provide us with a framework for understanding differences in ecometrics and, and ecological interaction. Um, but really, I would sort of rely on the histogram that has all the fauna to tell us something about the, the, the overall landscape. And maybe that's obvious to others, but I think it's an important point to drive home if you are doing isotope sampling somewhere. Don't just sample one taxa. Sample as, as a diverse of a, of a taxa as you can. OK, so now I'm going to move into the oxygen isotope record and what we can get from those data. Um, on the bottom, I sort of plotted here all the things that um, uh, we would consider using the aridity index of 11 at alt as evaporation um, insensitive taxa. So these, these are the things that track meteoric water. Uh, the hippos do quite well. The denotheres do extremely well. Um, and these, to a lesser extent, I don't know that I would quite hang my hat on using these yet in the fossil record. Um, the giraffids certainly show a response. The equids, uh, it's more variable, but it appears to be uh, tracking aridity. Um, same with the bovids. But again, taxonomically, quite difficult to get a handle on. And so you need to be careful using these. Uh, and then the suids appear to be responding as well. So uh, this is from Naomi's talk yesterday. We can get some idea for aridity by um, taking giraffes and subtracting hippos. Uh, and if we do that, <laughs> um, if, if we do that, here's what we get. So um, these, again, are the modern um, um, <coughs> Epsilon values for giraffe minus hippo. And actually, I, I was digging through a dissertation and found that if you actually plot water deficit that's measured at these sites um, with the, the epsilon value, you get a R squared of 0.9999 something. And so you can actually plot water deficit here with respect to the modern ecosystems. And so I just plot some of the sites where we have um, some of the data. And so Nikali, remember, this is the, the C3 dominated site. Um, actually, this is probably the wettest value we've seen. I think a lot of Naomi's data yesterday was sort of over in this space. So 
you might argue there's a unidirectional shift um, towards sort of higher water deficit or more arid environments. Um, but again, this is a fairly limited data set. But it shows what we can do with oxygen isotopes in enamel given the right taxa. Okay, so in summary, um, you know, th this we've got 450 teeth that we analyzed. And with that, we get a really nice record of this differential response of these different lineages, herbivore lineages, through time. And so C4 grass was a new dietary component. Um, the perissodactyls picked it up first. Uh, the equids followed by the, the rhinos at about 9.6. Um, and, and broadly, we can say that, you know, we're probably moving from a closed environment in Nakali to more open and mixed environments um, at the Samburu Hills and, and Lothagam from 9.6 to, say, 4 million years. Um, we can make use of the uh, enamel oxygen data um, using hippos or denethyrs as evaporation insensitive taxa, and the giraffes still seem to be the best uh, environmentally or evaporation sensitive taxon. Uh, and then this is a big one here. At, at at Nakali and the Samburu Hills, uh, well, certainly at Nakali, there are no soil carbonates. And it seems like it was probably just too wet. Sedimentation rates were high. And so that's what originally got me interested in um, starting to work on biomarkers. Um, and so I think we really need to couple enamel isotope records where we can with uh, paleo vegetation proxies like soil carbonates or, or um, well, so pedogenic carbonates or um, um, paleosol biomarkers. Um, and we need to continue to think about the spatial temporal characteristics of, of our proxy. You know, enamel isotopes versus these other isotopic records or you know, faunal abundance of grazing species, whatever the case may be. So uh, I'll end here by thanking lots of folks, particularly um, the museum who uh, allowed us access to the collection to, to sample all these teeth. Uh, lots of folks who have had great discussions with um, all the people who collected these fossils uh, and some important sources of funding. And with that, I think we'll just take questions to this or any broader um, discussion questions. Thank you. In your, in your water deficit calculations, it seems to be remarkably dry. That sort of seems to tie in with there being a lot of open landscapes. Um, I do, what is remarkably dry, though? I don't know. I mean, th these are um, the modern environments. You know, Sabo's pretty dry, but I guess we can cast it in this water deficit, uh, maybe the most quantitative way. But uh, yeah, it's dry, but not as dry as. as what we would infer using the, the data set that Naomi um, showed yesterday, where I think, uh, and Naomi, maybe you can be more specific, but I think a lot of the stuff from uh, the late Pliocene, early Pleistocene plots uh, kind of in, in here. In Aussie, it's about 700 millimeters of rain a year, yeah. which is a little bit like New York City. So, I mean, Why that New York City, Ben? Is New York City 1268? Yeah, In those, you know, water deficits between 500 and 1,000 meter millimeters a year. So, and so all of the plio, the Pleistocene stuff that we have from, this, you know, just a little bit north of this, or in in the same Turkana region, it ranges from, you know, what would be on the, you know, 700 millimeters up to 1,500 millimeters, right? So, we're sort of the the low end of the range in the Pleistocene is the high end of the range here. So it is, I think it would, it, you know, it's oscillating between two different. States, yeah. So in general, it's more dry in the Plyo Pleistocene yeah. than in the late Miocene. And I, I like that way of looking at it, Naomi, where for those of you who have been to these sites, you can just sort of think about what they look like throughout the year. <clears throat> and maybe what we need to do is also present what these, what these the differences in vegetation between these, 
what these different landscapes look like for those of us who don't yeah. have them impr imprinted Frank, on you, our brains. Could you provide woody cover for these areas broadly? Performance art piece. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in terms of in terms of overall woody cover, Athi is basically Nairobi, and Nairobi is right on the transition from open, really fairly open grasslands with 10% woody cover to actually forest. So you get above 800 millimeters of rain in a year in that area and you're pretty much in forest. And at 700 you're in fairly open grasslands and I guess, I mean I'll, I'll say it now because I may not get a chance when we do discussion, but I, I do think we need to be careful the way we use the word grasslands because ecologically it really means less than 10% woody cover and likewise when we talk about aridity uh, the true grasslands in Africa are not in arid places. There are places like Nairobi that get, you know, seven, eight hundred millimeters of rainfall a year is where you get your best African, some of the best African grasslands. the lack of archaeology. Um, it, it, so thinking about the, the problems with the, um, the hominin fossil record as far as first and last appearance dates and the, the uncertainties with regard to those. If we want to make progress with this topic, it seems like more emphasis on archaeology would help, be helpful given the, the, the greater size of the archaeological record and the uh, typically much better preservation. A lot of the environmental data that we do have is in direct context for archaeological sites. And so we can really, and I agree with you, we can actually, we know how humans are using the landscape in a much more detailed way with the archaeology. And we can actually test those human environmental interactions in a much greater way with the archaeology, with our so archaeological data. And it's very possible to pair it with a lot of these proxies that we're using. So I think the records are there to do it, definitely. Yeah, um, I mean, it's been really fascinating to see all these wonderful environmental and climatic things. Oh. It's, been, it's been great to see all these, you know, wonderful data sets, of the, the climate, the environment, and, you know, really what I'm interested in, I think a lot of us are, is ultimately in sort of that climate, environment, geological, biological interface. And one of the things that Turi was just talking about, it starts getting to is thinking about, well, rainfall and what does that mean? And, and the seasonality, and just a few things that I throw out there that, you know, and you know, I'd, I'd like to have a discussion about this at some point, but you know, the rainfall situation is pretty complex. When you talk to like a plant ecologist in a variety of places in Africa, and, and it's going to depend on the region. One of the first things that they'll tell you is a sweet felt versus sour felt, typical terms in South Africa, and the sweet felt is in the lower rainfall area of uh, what they often call the savanna grassland variation. And that's, so they actually consider herbivores prefer the areas with the lower rainfall. This is not, they don't prefer Turkana. But when you're in this region, the relatively higher rainfall areas are generally considered dystrophic, lower quality for, for grazers. Um, you know, the other part of this that I think is very interesting, particularly in this region, would be the things like the volcanics. And how is that coming into play? Because when you talk about 
you know, savanna quality as sort of fertile versus non-fertile or eutrophic versus dystrophic. The other big thing is anytime you have volcanics, it fundamentally changes the nature of herbivore biomass. I mean massively. So when you're in a volcanically active region, you would expect massive impacts on the nature of the herbivores. And I think that's potentially of some relevance here where you're on older um, landscapes, generally the herbivore biomass drops by three times. And the way they utilize the landscapes in those is, tends to be very different. So anyway, I guess all I wanted to say is I, I think it would be interesting to have a conversation about how all of these things are interacting. Um, let me just, um, so one of the things I would like us to do is um, I have no idea what will become of this short document that we give to Richard, but one of the things that he closed this conversation with me is that, you know, maybe you'll actually come up with something good and we can turn it into a program. You know, and, and that's a nice tease for us, I think a good challenge for us. So I think our ability to think um, beyond what we've done today, I mean, I think one of the questions, you know, the, the main question of this seminar has been, did, did climate shape African um, uh, uh, human evolution? You know, I, I think that question is, is, is still a distant uh, hope for us, but I would like to see us as a community try to find a way to come together to attack either a, a central part of that question or at least the overall thrust of what we're trying to get at, this linkage between climate and life with some, with some meaningfulness and some, you know, something that's a little bit more uh, diagnostic than we've been doing. I think, um, so that's, I think that's the challenge out to all of us. Uh, Rowan? Um, one thing that I've been wondering about mm -hmm. here is um, we've, yeah, we've talked about aridification quite a bit. And of course, I, I say talk about CO2, and some other people say talk about other things, include them in the conversation. But one thing we haven't talked about uh, is these changes, especially aridification, on the human body or the hominid body itself. How how is, are we as a species adapting to these increasingly extreme conditions? And you know, a lot of the traits we talk about, full body sweating, loss of hair, would seem to feed into this. But it's, it's sort of like, what's the ecophysiology? How is the ecophysiology of the hominids changing as we go across this? We've talked about the grasses. We've talked about all these other animals. But what about the hominids themselves, and in particular, things like the predators who had to also adapt to these increasingly extreme conditions. So that's sort of maybe a direction that has to be brought into the discussion, you know, as, as this goes forward. Okay, yeah. Not today, but, you know, in the next few years. Uh, Kevin, then Rick. Uh, I think that was a good question, Rowan, but, you know, before we put the cart before the horse, I mean, I think we need to like ask the questions, where do we need to improve our environmental records or our climate proxies? Because I think um, Sarah did a nice job showing today that, that even back at the Australopithecus time, was it 3.2 or something, things were very variable then. And so what really was the, the magnitude or the amount of change that, you know, w when did these changes occur? Because she showed that it's been fairly variable for the last 12 million years, or at least the last five, there's a solid record. So, you know, before we start posing these questions, do we need to say where do we focus um, on improving the environmental record before we ask the, the questions? I think uh, we're, we're outlining a variety of different areas where we could improve. Yes, the, 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 the indicator records, um, the, the articulation between um, the paleoanthropological community and the paleoenvironmental community to a much more explicit way than has been done. That's sort of what Mark's comment is with regard to increasing the representation of the archaeological uh, record in this. We also might consider um, Geneticists, for example, the genetics of um, of a modern human 
uh, loss of, or shortening, shall we say, uh, of uh, hair, basically nakedness of skin, probably related to, and genes related to skin pigmentation, those actually are traced back to about 1.2 million years ago. Well, what's that all about if, in fact, things have been open since 2 million? Um, that doesn't make sense from a human physiological standpoint. And it could it be that maybe Turi's uh, matter of, well, staying in shade somehow did it, but how can you stay in shade all of the time? Uh, that becomes a real matter of uh, selection pressure for, with regard to folate, which has to do with uh, reproductive success and uh, vitamin D uh, production. Uh, for any any primate, um, but uh, you know, I think that that we might even bring bring in some of the geneticists here to try to figure out when some of these uh, environmental challenges actually produced uh, selection pressures uh, that drove changes in the human genome. Okay. And then Renee. I I don't know. Maybe this will derail and good discussion now, but somebody <laughs> said something very smart yesterday, and I'm terribly embarrassed to have forgotten who it was. What would it take to reject the hypothesis that climate change changed, shaped human evolution? I think that is a question that we might, we really might spend some time on thinking about. Yes, I'm, I'm not going to answer uh, Mikael's question, um, but um, <laughs> I, I did want to did want to point out a couple of things. Uh, uh, Mark's comment, I think, is a good one um, in, in terms of expanding the range of people that, that we have here, and likewise, uh, uh, Rick's uh, in terms of uh, geneticists. But at the same time, I think uh, with what we've seen just in the last couple of days here, there's a lot of room for much closer collaboration among the people here, um, and. Uh, I can think of uh, the example of uh, Lars Werdelin working on the carnivore guild, and I'm working on the animals that, that his animals eat. And, uh, uh, but in a way, working in parallel, but we can do a lot of this uh, intertrophic sort of uh, analysis. Um, another example, uh, Naomi's data on the, on the uh, pedestal carbonates can be integrated, I think, much better than, than we have done uh, up to now with uh, faunal data and other sources of, of evidence. So, uh, again, I would welcome the expansion of, of, of the, the, the niche space, so to speak, but, but also a greater integration that, that, would be, that would follow very easily, I think, from what we've seen here these two days. Along those lines of the expansion of our field, um, it seems to me also that the, the scale of what we're talking about is, is crucial to how we're interpreting it and how we're extending our abilities or our toolkits to each other. Just earlier, Terry was talking about, well, you know, you're looking at a lake record that's 1% or less of what I'm looking at at Turkana, and that's 1% or less of what Sarah's looking at in the, in, the, in the ocean. How do those things scale, and how do we understand what a local process means in, within a basin, within a region, within a subcontinent, and how can we contextualize those changes in a way that means something to the evolutionary processes we're seeing? I don't want to sound negative after this wonderful meeting, but as Renee showed us, hominins are an extremely small part of an ecology, of a biome. And we're most interested in this problem, many of us, because of the hominin record. But it's very hard to link climate change to human evolutionary changes when both the climate zones or signals and the human transitions between taxa are rather fuzzy to begin with. We're correlating the phone book. I remember papers on the paleomagnetic record which clearly showed that every paleomagnetic reversal caused something. Sure, if you have enough points, you can correlate whatever you want. And maybe we should be best, first of all, to focus on the fellow travelers, the bovids and carnivores and maybe even monkeys that Renee and others talked about, where we have 
more taxa in more lineages and we can look for patterns of change across large groups. I mean, that's been done by several people, Rene, Kay Berensmeyer, and, and many others. And look for patterns there and then see if the humans might drop into those rather than trying to focus first on humans. And I would just make a plea while we were talking about scale, uh, not to forget the scale at which evolution or natural selection or selective pressures are operating, which is on the scale of the individual, not the species and not transitions among or between species. Oh, I'm a bit more optimistic than, than Eric. Um, for the last couple of years, there have been a group of us in Canada been trying to sort of develop a, a proposal for a program with a similar sort of focus, but for the, for the last 200,000 years. And, and one of the things that we've basically concluded by bringing together um, archaeologists, paleontologists, and, and climate folk is that a really important missing part of the puzzle has been the theory side of things and the ability to explicitly predict uh, behavior of, of hominins uh, in response to climate change. And I think in, in the context of um, you know, thinking about early human evolution, that, 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 that's also an important consideration. I think if we want to move beyond the, uh, the fairly sort of straightforward correlation of, of, of events in, that are recorded in, in these proxy indicators and, and the sort of first appearance dates, last appearance dates of, of hominins and that sort of thing, that sort of very broad um, can come across as fairly hand wavy side of things. If we want to go beyond that, we're going to need to explicitly bring in a behavioural ecological theory to bear on it, and we're also going to uh, increasingly need to bring in to, um, sort of cultural evolutionary theory as well, since that becomes such an important part of, of human evolution later on. What's going on in other parts of the world where you have primate guilds or monkey guilds, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, in the Americas, where we see seeing similar trends as we have this deterioration of the environment? Yeah, and that's, that was actually something to raise at lunch, was actually trying to extend our reach into places that are not as well explored. And this is actually one of the things Richard, that came up in the NRC report. A number of the people in this room were, were co authors on that. But one of the ideas was, you know, imagine you had unlimited funds, right? What, what, what would you want to do? Let's just say the, the, uh, uh, you know, the budget for this research was had another zero on the end or more. What would you do with that? And one of the ideas that came up was, say all the big big oil fields are found is 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 is, is patently untrue um, and specifically on oil uh, Kenya was not known to have any oil I think everyone may be surprised fairly soon um, no I, I don't think we found oil, but I don't think increased exploration if you added that much to the, the budget would necessarily result, result I mean finding finds is partly serendipity partly very skilled set of eyes, mm -hmm. but um, we do need more money. There's no question we need more money, and, and you need better trained people to do it. But funnily enough, looking for fossils is often done better by people who have not got a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think Rich and I probably agree on this, but this may sound as if we don't. Um, 
Meve had written with Renee and others a, a hominid grant that one of the things it proposed was to have uh, prospecting teams out 12 months a year and excavation teams out 12 months a year and fossil preparators working 12 months a year. We have the fossil preparators working 12 months a year because we have such a huge backlog of fossils and they're, they're going to be made available for study much more quickly. But I think that in an area like the Takana Basin where there is you know, plenty of, of work to be done going back to visit areas. You know, Tim's argument was once you've picked it up, you're going to have to wait 100 years before anything more comes to the surface. That may be true for his site, but it's not true everywhere. And I think we feel that year-round prospecting and excavation and collecting at Takana would increase the yield of fossil material quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. I think it's exploration for new sites and new regions that is, is a little bit more speculative. Right. I'm just a little hesitant about saying we found all the sites or the major fields that we want to look at. If you'd said that before Yves Capons and later Michel Brunet went to Chad, we'd be missing a lot of interesting ideas. If you'd said that to Tim Bromage and Freedom and Shrank, who spent 10 years in Malawi finding a total of 50 fossils a year before they found a hominin jaw, which shows that Rudolf Ensis appears to have been in Malawi at 2.4 plus or minus, um, that would have been a rather negative way of looking at things. There are always more places to look at. And it's true that somebody may have found a fossil in one of these areas a while ago, but nobody's gone back there. So expanding new areas with an approach such as Frank suggested about plotting things on a map, there's many approaches to GIS that have been suggested in the American West. Bob Anamone and Glenn Conroy published a very interesting paper about this recently where you can decide what kinds of geography and surface geology seems to lead to finding fossils in a region and then go there and actually find something new. I, I would hate to restrict us to say, well, we've gone all the interesting places. <laughs> 10 out of 11 times, those new places are going to be useless, and one, they'll be really interesting, maybe. Um, I'd just uh, like to add a little bit to this. I think, um, just to follow up after my talk, um, I think really just bringing together the marine and terrestrial sites and really trying to correlate them more might help with this idea of trying to map out really interesting um, sites to explore. Um, also, just figuring out like what the timing of the geology is across a variety of areas, and then using our um, hopefully increasing knowledge of um, uh, interesting periods of climate might help us uh, look even further into this uh, strategy of targeting interesting geological formations, and then looking there to see if we can find interesting fossils, but also chemistry and vegetation as well. Uh, yeah, I, I think that it's, it's great. We need, we need more fossils, more, more basins, more regions of Africa to, uh, uh, to get uh, adequate records um, from both from the, the hominin standpoint and the paleoenvironmental standpoint. Uh, that's still going to leave us with a science of correlation. And uh, I think one of the phrases I used yesterday in response to the one comment that I got after my talk was a, a, the concept of middle range theory. How do you connect up from the correlation to an actual causal explanatory uh, understanding of whether and how climate um, affected uh, human evolution? Well, some of the middle ground there, some of the links we need to make in the chain we need to involve, I think, uh, many more ecologists who understand how you go from 
a particular kind of rainfall regime to a particular kind of resource landscape to how that then affects different kinds of organisms because organisms will change their demography, their population structure, their density or not uh, depending upon what their starting point is. And so some will uh, respond as broad niche, broad habitat kind of uh, interactors with their surroundings and other ones as very, very specific ones. So we may come up with an environmental indicator in the paleo record uh, that says, okay, here was a major excursion. And you then study, say, maybe the bovids happen to be ones that respond in a very habitat-specific way to that. But primates may not. And, and hominins, I would suggest, tend to ratchet up the, ver the, the adaptability. So they have intended to increase their niche breadth over time. And so we may be coming up, we need to come up with multifaceted explanations for a variety of taxonomic groups at the same time as we're looking at the hominins and trying to fill in the relationship of climate to resource landscapes to adaptive <coughs> pressures to processes by which genetic change occurs that might lead to those sorts of evolutionary changes we're interested in. It's all about process and if we can't get beyond correlation, I think we're just going to continue spinning our wheels on this particular question. Just very quickly this time. Just, I, I completely agree. The one thing I would add would be, uh, I'd say wi even within hominins, I think we have potential reason to believe that there would have been um, a great diversity in ways of uh, responding to climate and environmental change. And I, my plea would be is if, if this is to be sort of the study of how climate change affects human evolution, Let's not leave the human evolutionary biology and the human biology and ecology out of the equation. That has to be up there on par with the work on the climate research because we can have a great record, but if we don't know anything about the biology and ecology, these guys, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. Yeah, so I think that following on both of those points in a really valuable way and then the points that Richard made earlier is that, you know, this, this meeting has shown that we have some, an amazing set of records, an amazing set of tools. And now we have these really critical questions. And I think what we need to do is what we need to say, let's take these questions and let's probe the records in the places where we can really answer those questions at the time periods that are really relevant to those questions. So let's say, split it up into four main questions. Let's say bipedalism, origin of stone tools, expansion out of Africa at 1.8, and, you know, and then the re-expand, whatever. Ask, let's ask some key questions that are critical to human evolution. And then let's probe the parts of the record that we can answer those questions. And we can still, I think that the geochemical community has shown that we can still do a lot of building of these records to make them better. But we can tell Rich Lane, we're doing a lot on a shoestring already. And if you can actually give us money to do this kind of work, we can really tell you, we can show you how it should be done. And we can do it. And we can do it in direct, targeted ways to ask some of these ecological, biological driven questions to understand the how. But we also, at the same time that we're understanding the details of the what. And so I think that what we could do as a community is to say, articulate what the questions are, articulate key question, places where we can answer places and methods that we can go about answering those questions and sort of blitz them with like, do you, do you really want this? Well, in this room, we know how to do it actually, right? That's not a question. And I think that we could articulate that. And then, you know, I think Rowan's argument is really that mentioning that we have this amazing opportunity in East Africa in the Pleistocene, in the late Miocene to the Pleistocene, that we have this to actually understand how, we have the record to answer very specific questions that other p people studying other regions and times would love to do, right? And so can we just really do it up for the, t the place where we can do it up, you know, and really sh use it as a test case of how we can look at climate and biotic changes through time. So I think we can articulate this. And, at countering everybody else's ideas in this manner, so. Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, there seems to be an elephant in this room. It's very quiet, but uh, you know, and I'm I'm really jealous of of uh, you know the paleoclimate modelers, the uh, or the paleoclimate people, the isotope people. Not only do you have, you know great new methods, you have great new technologies, um, you have fantastic uh, data now. Uh, but you also have uh, an army of bright, willing students and funding for them to get the work done. Um, 
And it's all, it, you know. I mean, we've, we've, we've heard a couple of, of those students today. Uh, and, but, and it's all well and good to say that, you know, if we increase the funding X amount, we can, you know, find X more number of more fossils. But we need somebody to study those fossils. And the lesson that I have learned from, that I learned from uh, editing Cenozoic Mammals of Africa is that we're running out of people. You know, we're, in another generation or two, we're not going to have anybody to study the fossils. Uh, I mean, just to take myself as an example, you know, I started working on the African carnivores 18 years ago. It's taken that time to understand what's, what's going on to get to the point where I am now. 18 years, you know, another 18 years into the future, I'll presumably be long retired. Who's going to take over? And that's, that's something that hasn't been mentioned at all here. I mean, we've talked about it outside, but I think that's, that's a, a real concern if we want to understand hominid evolution, we have to understand the evolution of the fauna. Not, you know, I mean, climate, yes, but we under, have to understand the animals with which the, the humans interact, not just the humans. So, I mean, th we need strategies to address that. It's a strategic issue. Well, as an outsider looking in, listening to this, I think you're all being a little bit humble. I think it might be interesting if some of you were to say, what do we know? I saw a tremendous amount of data that was out there about grasslands, about environments that these hominins were in, that, um, about the shifts in animal diets. It seems to me that there's some really interesting hints of changes in grasslands coming earlier, <coughs> that changes in the environment in all different ways that are, ha that are coming along at maybe not precisely when there are big changes in human evolution, but at important time periods. And if you could pull some of that together and then talk about what we don't know, what do we need to test about those ideas, it might be a really interesting process. Because as I sit here and review my notes, I'm thinking, there's some things here I haven't heard before about the habitats or about the trends in change that began before two million years ago. So that would be what I would throw out to you at this point. I think there's quite a bit there that I've been hearing in the way of data from different data sets and methods. Well, I, I was going to try to answer um, or encourage us to think about Rich Lane's question, which was, you know, if you have ideas, NSF might be interested in helping. And my experience with NSF is that they like big deployments, right, a drilling project or ships that go to sea or big programmatic, you know, efforts that are finite but um, uh, I involve equipment. So you can think of uh, the earth scope uh, deployments. And so I, I would encourage us to think about um, an infrastructure uh, uh, help that could come from NSF other than fund more students and, and change the, the the job prospects for those students that we have so that we get more students into the system and things like that, that we should really think about um, a tangible suggestion, such as a drilling project. I, I, um, I'm not a scientist, and I'm incredibly impressed by everything you all do. But I was married to a scientist for nearly 60 years, and I'm a local historian. And as you have been talking, I have been thinking about the complexity of the interchanges between the environment, the animals, and the humans, just in terms of this community in the last 100 years, and um, the forest cover, which has grown back because no people are no longer farming, the deer who have uh, come back, although uh, you know 100 years ago nobody saw deer, people would have shot them. Now they're laws and the deer ticks and the coyotes uh, and, it's, and the vegetation, the invasive vegetation, it's just so incredibly complicated that I think it will be wonderful if you can discover anything. <laughs> This has been a wonderful workshop. Uh, but uh, we have, you have some sampling issues. There are certain periods of time you don't have, 
from, from the terrestrial point of view, you don't have the continuity that you have in deep sea drilling. But again, your deep sea drilling was an early generation where you had gaps in your cores. What would it take to, uh, to drill more of these cores, exploratory cores, where it isn't so important that you intersect a bone or a tooth or a jaw, but that you build complete sequences to which all the, the uh, genetic and biological markers can be done on so that the, the, that the time span is, is, is complete. And, and would you at that point then see uh, sharper events or something that might tie into the, to the, to the fossil record? And the infrastructure, so this is something that could attract uh, If, for example, at, at Gubbio in Italy, where you they found the in the in the outcrop the succession across the Cretaceous Tertiary boundary, but then the drill core there was so much richer, uh, and uh, so I throw that out as a as infrastructure. Richard has a comment. It's just a very simple question, but I think it's something we should all think about. Um, in the last five minutes, we've referred to human evolution, hominid evolution. Yesterday, we talked about hominin evolution. They're all slightly different. Um, and if we're talking about humans, I, I think of us as humans. I'm not sure I think of Paranthropus as a human. And I think most of you would probably agree in one sense, but they, well, it's not a human and it's not on the direct line, but it's a hominid or a hominin, depending on how conservative you are. Now, clearly, to understand human evolution, we've got to understand the hominid players from which we apparently are derived. And to understand those, you've got to understand what comes before, which is the hominins. And you've got to look at that in the context of environments <coughs> which are forced by climate. But I think there's a remarkable lack of precision in the use of the English language in discussions of this kind, because we have seen slides that depict a theory or a, a, a scenario which has Homo, earliest Homo, coming off variously between 2.2 and 1.8. Some people in this room have suggested in print, in nature, or other such places, with respect to Anne, um, that, that Homo comes off much earlier and it's a lineage now, if we're looking at, at, at the origin of, of, of Homo, are we talking about Homo agaster, whatever that is, or Homo sapiens? If it comes off at three and a half million years, or three million years, as opposed to two million years, you have a very different scenario when looking at the backdrop of environmental change forced by climate. And I, I don't think we're being totally honest with ourselves, let alone with each other, when we, we simply ignore other points of view that presumably had some basis in being presented by simply skipping over the awkward parts because it doesn't fit what you're about to say. And I think in these meetings, and, and I've said, said to Peter, I think one of the problems is what I said at the beginning. I think we have once again, out, inside this room, talked at each other, not to each other. And I think the lady who married to a scientist for 60 years, poor lady, um, <laughs> it's a long time to be with any scientist, uh, has a point when saying, if you can ever sort this out, good luck to you. But I think we could go a lot further than we're getting if we at least talked about different scenarios when addressing these problems. And I, 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 you don't have to say that Tim White and his lot are right or wrong, but it's one scenario. And there's another one that Rick Potts postulates. And there's another one that, that uh, Bernard Wood, who's been remarkably quiet at this conference, uh, may, may, may enunciate. So I think we, we really, I, my plea as, as a, 
a bareback. And I was saying to somebody, a bareback comes after a silverback. It all falls off and you're absolutely <laughs> <laughs> discarded from the community. But as a bareback, relatively toothless, somewhat blind and hard of hearing, I think you could do better if you listen to each other and acknowledge that each of you have a, a, a point of view. And the only person who's talked about the other side of the coin in terms of evolution is Lars. And he talked about extinction. And presumably you've got to have as much, if not more, extinction to have evolution. And we've talked, Matt and others have talked about being biologists and talking about trophic space and trophic levels. Well, good heavens, you can't keep filling it up. You've got to get some things out of it. And I haven't any heard anybody talk about the mysteries of what happened to Pelorovis or Sivotherium or what happened to the poor old Boise eyes. So that would be my plea. I, th I think we need to get a little closer uh, to, be to the real world in these sort of discussions. And I won't say another word, I promise. <laughs> But it's sort of a hard one to follow, but <laughs> um, <laughs> um, another, another point here to, to get back to the matter of, I think, what is that Rich Lane's question is, um, how, how is paleoanthropology and its, the, its connection to larger questions or large questions of Earth history, such as climate, climate change, variability, uh, how, how are we to make this more scientific? than it already is, more than just so stories. And one of the things that I recall from uh, one of my own graduate school advisors, Alan Walker, was that it's really hard to have a science of unique events. Science is, is based upon having something that's somehow a rep repetition of a kind. And that it's important to not cons just consider this as solely trying to understand you know, the origin of, of Homo sapiens as a singular, uh, unrepeated phenomenon. But rather, we need to kind of think, uh, I think, cleverly about uh, how human evolutionary history has represented a number of different evolutionary events, um, each of which can be considered, I agree with, with Richard, uh, as you know, a, a number of scenarios. Um, but in a sense, we need to be clever, I think, in developing a sort of thing that could become a program at NSF, is how do we, whether you want to call it a variety of um, important junctures or events in human evolution, we have a number of, I, that's one of the reasons why I, I think the, uh, both the, the idea of the possibility of, of several periods of time of, of aridity, uh, or that there are these, the possibility through the precession index of that there are multiple times of higher amplitude, higher amplitude climate change uh, variability and lower. Uh, there are you know, about 70 of those alternating intervals through time that we can be clever in trying to figure out um, the variety of re repeated of a kind environmental events and um, that there are a variety of speciation, the first and last appearance <coughs> events and also adaptive change events. And we have to figure out a way to somehow match those up uh, in ways that are more than just, well, let's explain the origin of the genus Homo. That's a science of unique events, and it's going to be very, very difficult to show anything that's compelling and convincing. Well, lots of things that can be compelling, but not convincing. Okay, well, I have one last comment by Mikhail, and then uh, I, I have the mic here. Can I? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to make a comment on um, just thinking about money and programs. I've had two one-day meetings with uh, Rich Lane recently, and he did an NSF workshop at USC where he talked about the types of programs that there are, like MG and G permanent programs, and then temporary programs like P2C2, Paleo Climate Program. And I was thinking about the size of this room in the community, and I, I find it hard to see how we could sustain a program like Paleo Climate, uh, P2C2, whatever, the, whatever it stands for. Um, but. So then I was thinking as well, there's also this mechanism of the sort of STC, and at USC there's also the deep energy biosphere has just been proposed as an STC, and it seems to me that as a community that type of mechanism might be a viable one. Now I have no intention of doing anything like that myself, given that I'm on the tenure track, but it seemed to me that an STC centered around climate change and human evolution might be a way to bring this community together frequently and often in many proposals through a, a mechanism like that. What is an STC? <laughs> it's a hundred page proposal. Who wants to write one? Sorry, it's 
it's um, you, you write a pre-proposal, which is fairly substantial, and then as a and then it gets invited for a full round. It's um, I think a hundred-page proposal rather than a standard fifteen-page NSF proposal, um, and then I believe it's on the. Deep Biosphere one is a $25 million grant. It's awarded to a PI at an institution. So USC is extremely pleased with that professor. And then you are sort of a grant giving agency and people write proposals to you and then you deliver them to the community. So somebody here, senior PI, could take the lead on writing an STC with a team and then would become basically their own program. So I think something could come out of here where we could you know, form a group that might be able to do something like this. Yeah, I just want to, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just on for two pages. <laughs> and Mikhail, last comment. Um, okay, um, a little less concrete, but um, about the content of what some initiative like that might, might contain, trying to bring together the, um, several people here repeated that it's obvious that we should have more integration between uh, data sources between methods and approaches. And then uh, Lars's concern, which I, I sh very much share, that we are running out of people who have an absolutely critical uh, piece of this. So um, to construct an infrastructure of some sort, a distributed nexus of databases, um, thought through to the extent that they actually make sense to the naive user um, making, making all these data available in some, some format that, that you can use even though you haven't used 18 years to study that particular thing is, uh, I think, a, a worthy go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, okay, now for something completely different. So I, I think about evolution and unique events a lot. Um, <clears throat> so here's the first unique event. Uh, we live in a, on a planet that is the fourth terrestrial, fourth terrestrial planets in this solar system. <clears throat> and we live in a habitable zone. And we have been in a habitable zone, as far as we can tell, since the Earth was formed 4.52 billion years ago. And the solar luminosity was 30% lower than it is today. So in order for there to have been liquid water on the surface of the planet, there had to be a huge amount of greenhouse gas forcing. And what exactly the greenhouse gas forcing is has been very controversial. For many years, it's been thought to be very high amounts of carbon dioxide. There are attempts to constrain that with looking at the sedimentary record as best we can from rocks that are about 3.8 billion years old. And it would appear that carbon dioxide concentrations would have to have been approximately 1,000 fold higher than they are today to sustain liquid water on the surface of the planet. One other option, or an additional greenhouse gas, that was possible was methane. So those methane under an anaerobic condition has a very, very, very long lifetime on the order of about 50,000 years under oxidizing conditions is a very short lifetime. It only has a lifetime of about 40 years. So of the three planets that are in the habitable zone, um, Mars, Earth, and Mercury, one is too hot, one is too cold, and one is just right. One potentially had liquid water on it about 2.5 or so billion years before the present time. That's Mars. Venus has this huge, huge, huge amount of carbon dioxide today and it's way too hot. There's no liquid water on the surface. None of us, none of the three planets got locked into a, a tidal lock radius. That's a very fortuitous consequence where one side of the planet faces the sun all the time. That's the tidal lock radius. And we see that, for example, in many astronomical observations. For example, Europa is in a tidal lock. So these are the buyer's guides. This is. This guy ran out of radio, radiogenic heat. It still has radiogenic heat, probably, but 
not enough to cause any tectonic activity on the surface. It had a tectonic activity a long time ago. So it ran out of gas. So the source of carbon dioxide to the planet, our planet, is volcanism. And it's available to us because of tectonics. And because of tectonics that are driven by potassium-60, thorium, and uranium. And of course, there is tectonics here, no magnetic field on this planet. Okay? Solar wind wiped this atmosphere away. We still have an atmosphere. So <coughs> there are singularities here. Now, the singularities lead to a set of equations which we knew from the beginning of the last century, actually earlier there. <coughs> These are the Stefan Boltzmann equations. And they're the radial balance equations of a planet. So the surface of the planet is illuminated by solar radiation, which is distributed over the entire field of view, so the entire planetary surface. And there is an albedo of the planet. The albedo of the planet today is roughly 0.3. And if we solve this equation without a greenhouse gas, the planet would actually be frozen. So even the luminosity of today's sun is not sufficient without greenhouse gases to allow liquid water to remain liquid at the surface. So the inbound, outbound time, this would be about uh, 200 and uh, I think it's 271 degrees or something like that would be the predicted value uh, without any greenhouse gases. I, I don't remember it. I have to look at my, my notes when I teach this stuff. In any event, the luminosity of the, of, of the sun has allowed this planet to uh, maintain an atmospheric temperature at the surface, which has been between a value of about 70 degrees maximally and zero, but never significantly below that. Now, when we look at the planet from space, or we look at the, I'll show you that in a minute. If you just, this is an old slide from Tim Lenton, my colleague, one of my friends in, in the UK. The planetary surface uh, has an atmospheric composition which has a significant amount of methane in it, for example, nitrous oxide. Uh, it obviously has nitrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, which I explained mostly comes from uh, volcanoes, but nitrous oxide ammonia, dimethyl sulfide, isoprenes, methane, and hydrogen, and oxygen are all made by life. You're living in a planet with 21% volume of oxygen, and that is not a trace gas anymore. So to first order, all animal life is a singularity. So we do have another singularity. Okay. These gases absorb hugely in the middle infrared, which is why the greenhouse gas system allows life to exist on this planet. I'm not going to go on to this. I just want to point out in the world of, of general biology and biogeochemistry and Earth history, the organisms that are responsible for those gases are not animals. Animals are a crown group. They're right here. I mean, I hate to tell my students this, but we're very closely related to fungi. And there are land plants. <coughs> They're a crown group, too. So there may be 250,000 C3 plants, but they're all very, very, very closely related on this scale to each other. And unfortunately, if you go to a Department of Ecology and Evolution, you study two crown groups for the most part. Most Departments of Ecology and Evolution are focused on animals and plants because they're basically departments that are very, very traditional and have not accepted even the understanding of microbes. So virtually everything else on this graph is a single-celled organism. Not everything, but virtually everything. <clears throat> now down here, are two main groups, the archaea and the bacteria, which are single-celled prokaryotic organisms. They have no nuclei. And the topology of this graph is a little weird, but I'm just going to explain another singularity. One more singularity. One archaean cell here 
ingested at one point an alpha proteobacteria. That's a bacteria that probably was photosynthetic, but is anaerobic. It's photosynthetic under anaerobic conditions only. And that gave rise to the first eukaryotic cell. That's a singularity. So we are a fusion between our archaean host cell and a bacteria. That's what we are. A second symbiotic association occurred, and there was the only other symbiotic association that ever occurred that we can tell. And that was when that cell, one of those host cells, which was already with a mitochondrion, a proto-mitochondrion, ingested a cyanobacterium, which is a single-celled organism that is the only clade of organisms in the entire prokaryotic world that produces oxygen photosynthetically, this one, one single event occurred and it gave rise to all eukaryotic algae. Once. That was a singularity. So there were two singularities that occurred in Earth's history. The timing of these events is very, very difficult to determine with precision. So the origin of cyanobacteria is between, and this is the uncertainty of it, it is between 3.5 billion years and about 2 point, it can, cannot be later or earlier, um, excuse me, later than 2.4 billion years. So this is a 1 billion year window of uncertainty, unbelievably enough. <laughs> the timing of the origin of eukaryotes is similarly not very, very well known, but it's on the order of between 1.9 and about 2.5. It's on that, that order, okay? Now, I'm just, this is what I usually talk about. We have an electron transfer reaction system, so all organisms are doing this. They're transferring electrons between carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and hydrogen. <coughs> That's what you and I are doing. So it doesn't seem like that to you, but let's just take a breath for a second. You have just put electrons onto oxygen. You've made water, okay? You have, you have produced a water vapor. You have reduced the oxygen with the, uh, the hydrogen that was extracted from organic matter. Now, that's exactly what E. coli does. So when we look from a metabolic point of view, the engines of life are created here. Basically, everything here is just a reinvention of these research and development phase of Earth history into new body forms. Eukaryotes did basically nothing except design machines to carry these guys out, okay? From an evolutionary point of view, that's true. Now, the basic idea that I'm going to discuss is one that Vernadsky, at the beginning of the last century, made popular, and he was an incredibly brilliant, actually the first evolutionary bio, or he wasn't really an evolutionary, he discussed and described the concept of Earth systems. Vernadsky was amazing. <clears throat> And the reason we know about Vernadsky is he wrote a book, which was published in 1926, I believe, in France, but it was in Russian. His son left the Soviet Union and came to Yale University. And the book was translated by his son for Evelyn Hutchinson. So Evelyn Hutchinson knew about Vernadsky's work, but very few other people did. It wasn't until recently that that book was translated into English. So the basic idea is all organisms exchange gases with the environment. That's every single organism on the planet has to exchange a gas with the environment. Therefore, it can potentially modify the gas composition on a planetary scale. <clears throat> and that's what has happened on this, this planet. The primary agents are responsible for changes in the atmospheric composition are microbes, not plants and animals. The gas exchanges are the basis of life and reflect electron transfer reactions in a thermodynamic equilibrium, far from a thermodynamic equilibrium. I'm, I'm, and that's obviously a major, major statement. I don't want to go there. It is the major failure of biology. The failure of biology is to understand how this works. We have not figured out how electron transfer reactions work. The origins of life remains one of the major embarrassments of biochemistry, molecular biology, and structural biology to this day. It's an amazing embarrassment. Now, as I said, there are these major greenhouse gases. I'm not going to go into them in, in detail now, but I want to point out this graph, which is from uh, James Farquhar and Mark Thiemens, and it was published in Science in 2004, and it's probably one of the most important papers that has come out in the last 20 or 30 years in geochemistry, in my opinion. These are the sulfur isotope compositions of rocks. 
going from 3.8 billion to approximately 500 million, the beginning of the Phanerozoic. This is the beginning of the, the origin of animals that we can see in the fossil record. So look, keep your eyes on the green circles here. The green circles have this wide range until exactly about here. And then they just follow this line. What this tells you is these sulfur isotopes are fractionated independent of their mass, which is very, very, very unusual in isotope geochemistry. So that is what's called the cap delta 33s signature. This is a mass independent isotopic fractionation. Why would sulfur isotopes be fractionated independent of their mass? Well, sulfur, uh, sulfur dioxide specifically, has a UV cross section, an interactive UV cross section between 195 and about 220 nanometers, depending on the isotope. This went away at this point. So 195 to 220 nanometers, that's in the ultraviolet. So at some point, the ultraviolet light ceased. What causes ultraviolet light to cease? This gas, ozone. So where does ozone come from? Ozone cannot be made without oxygen. So at some point, about halfway through Earth's history, here's a singularity. Oxygen accumulated in Earth's atmosphere to the point that which it could make a sufficient amount of ozone to shield the UV light. How much oxygen was that? It was less than 1% of the present atmospheric value. Very, very small amount. But this is called the great oxidation event. Somewhat of a euphemism. <coughs> in any event, this, this juncture, the evolution of the cyanobacteria, which ultimately produced oxygen, and it's not just the evolution of cyanobacteria. You had to bury organic matter in order for this to uh, lead to the oxygen supply, led to an environment which ultimately became conducive for animals. Now, this is a very complicated graph, and I don't want to explain it to you because I just want you to see there's a wiring diagram for all the electron marketplace on the planet. They're interconnected. And it's interconnected via microbes. Plants and animals are a trivial fraction of the workings, the real working machinery of the planet. So this is the working machinery of how all the major elements of the planet are coupled electrically. This is an electrical circuit. And I've spent the last 10 years or so of my life trying to figure out how this works. I don't want to go into the whole details here. I'm just going to explain to you very quickly that there are only about 1,500 core genes that really make the planet go around. So we have sequenced about 20 million genes thus far. There are about 30,000 protein coding genes in the human being. Of those, the actual number that makes our machinery really work is about, in us, about 300. The rest of this is packaging. On the entire planet, there are only about 1,500. <clears throat> now, these are the domains of all the electron transfer reaction enzymes on the planet. It took us a long time to find these domains. These are the actual, there are 35 domains. That's it. And <clears throat> this is their evolution. They start out with very, very small enzymes, the iron sulfur cluster and ferredoxins, which you and I have. This is a 56 uh, amino acid sequence protein, which transfers electrons in our mitochondria. And that's the origin of all the major electron transfer reactions. And it winds up here with cytochrome C oxidase in this clade. The cytochrome C oxidase is that enzyme in our mitochondria which transfers the hydrogen as electron and proton, one after the other, to the oxygen that allows us to breathe. So that innovation occurred about 2.8 billion years ago, even before there was oxygen in the atmosphere. And that's it. This, this, this is the evolutionary history of the engines of life. It's not published yet. This is work from one of my graduate students, John Kim, who's a chemist and very, very smart guy. <laughs> now, this is the evolution of animals. This is from a paper that was published last year in, uh, in uh, Science by Doug Irwin and <clears throat> and, well, several, many authors, but Doug was the lead author on this. So we know 
that the very first node of animals occurred somewhere just, just, in the, just around the Ediacaran or maybe a little bit earlier. The molecular, this is a molecular clock diagram with uh, 72 priors, 72 nodes, which is an Bayesian prior analysis. So the origin of animals, the very first animals, multicellular organisms that ultimately would become fossil animals that we can see in the Ediacaran, occurred somewhere around 750 million years ago. That's, in the scheme of things, a very short period ago relative to the evolution of the core machines. Now I'm going to point out to you that it's not at all clear why animals evolved in the beginning, to begin with. You have tremendous disadvantages of being an animal. Your generation time is low, your diffusion limited always. You have one advantage in motility. Now, ultimately what these animals do is as we move out further and further in evolutionary history, we get into a very interesting situation which also occurred in plants, and that is we evolved very complicated sexual cycles. Sexual cycles do one thing that is very interesting from what happens in the microbial world. They actually prevent, because of the, the nature of, of, of fertilization, they prevent horizontal gene transfer from foreign invaders. So in the microbial world, genes are just swapped in and out of organisms all the time via viruses, via many different ways. But here, when you have, once you have sexuality, it's very, very difficult to have horizontal gene transfer. That means a lineage is stuck simply in a mating game. And that's the same thing is, is true to a very large extent in plants. So let me explain this just for one second. One, bear with me for one second. You and I, how many of you have ever had a cold, been sick? Okay, You have had a viral attack. Your somatic tissues have been infected and probably carry a virus, but not your germ cells. Your eggs or sperm, depending on who you are, are protected. Okay? This is why you can actually have HIV and give birth to an organism that doesn't have HIV. Now, <clears throat> or other diseases that are virally inherited. Now, I don't want to go into details on this, but the rise of land plants later on really gave a huge boost, ultimately, to the burial of organic matter, we think. And these are trees that are in the middle of the Carboniferous. That was a rise of, on the colonization of terra firma. This process, even though, even though the rise of, of animals really started in the Cambrian, there was a true Cambrian explosion, we believe, they didn't colonize land until much later. <coughs> and plants did two things. They create soils by weathering. And by weathering as well, they helped in the burial of organic matter and gave rise to an oxygen burst. Now, this is a reconstruction from my friend Bob Berner. And we'll go into this part of the record later with some other work that I did with Bob and with Mimi Katz and with others. <coughs> but there was a huge burst of oxygen in the Carboniferous up to about maybe 30 to 35 percent. It's very controversial what the exact value is. But very high concentrations of oxygen gave rise to a huge number of animal diversity. All right, then we have collapses. I mean, obviously, the end Permian was a big collapse, and most of the Mesozoic period, we had low oxygen concentrations. Even though we have large dinosaurs, the dinosaurs almost certainly were not warm-blooded. I'll explain that in a bit. So we have the ichthyosaurs that come out, for example, Brontosaurus, all these animals. They almost certainly were living at concentrations of oxygen on the order of about 15% oxygen. We have 21%. So lower oxygen concentrations than we have today, we believe. Here's an ammonite picture I took. This is a, the beginning of an ammonite that is about one and a half meters, ultimately went extinct. This, this is from Baja, Mexico. And 
This cycle has been set up for hundreds of millions of years, about 300 million years. So this is an annual cycle of productivity on the surface of the planet, seen from space. And it'll change on million year time scales simply because where rainfall patterns will be. The Sahara was wet at one time, so this would have been green. It's not red, wet now, so it's, it's a desert. Patagonian area, Australia. All these places can be wet or dry, depending on long-term climate change, depending on the continental configuration, depending on many, many things. But the point is that these organisms, both on land and in the ocean, when they die and that a small fraction of them, 0.01% approximately, becomes incorporated into the lithosphere, gives a rise to the oxygen concentration on the planet. And to first order, that's the most important thing for the evolution of mammals. So <clears throat> this is from a paper that Mimi Katz and I and uh, others wrote in, in science. And we analyzed several cores <clears throat> that go back to about 205 million years before present. And this is, we had both the organic matter and the carbonates. I'm just showing the carbonate sequence here. There's a secular increase in the delta 13C of the organic matter, I mean, of the carbonate, getting it slightly heavier up until exactly, of, well, right here in the middle of the Miocene. Now, what does this mean? This is about a 1.5 per mil increase in the carbonate, making it heavier. Rubisco fractionates, as we discussed yesterday. It takes the light isotope and it, it removes it and puts it in the lithosphere. The remaining carbon that is in the atmosphere ocean system gets heavier. We are just watching. You, this is actually Bob Garrell's idea. Bob was an amazing, amazingly prescient in this idea. The idea here is that you're using essentially delta 13C in carbonates to count electrons. If you are bearing organic matter, then you're bearing hydrogen. If you're bearing hydrogen, you're bearing reducing equivalents. If you're bearing reducing equivalents, you have to put an oxidizing equivalent somewhere. The oxidizing equivalent is oxygen. So this is a, a paleo record, essentially, of a long-term rise in oxygen from the Mesozoic through to the present. Now, there's a very funny thing here, Rowan. Right there, we see this excursion. <coughs> That excursion is most readily explained, not completely, but it's most readily explained by a rise of C4 photosynthesis. Yeah. <laughs> OK? So that, if you didn't know that, you would say there's a huge eruption of organic matter back into the atmosphere. The oxygen concentration went down, if you didn't know that. Now, I'm not going to go through, we've written many papers on this, and I'm not going to go through this. But here, the rise of mammals actually, as we all know, started at the lower portion of the Jurassic. That's where we, at least we have the first fossils. They go back to about 196, 197 million years. Uh, the organisms were probably insectivores. They were about this big. So those are our ancestors. They were running under the feet of dinosaurs. They paid they were like living in different worlds. And <clears throat> this is our reconstruction from this time. From This is Alroy's plot of the mass of general mass of animals, of mammals, in a natural log scale. This is a natural log units in grams. OK? Um, <clears throat> so mammals took a little bit of a jump up at the KT boundary, but it was at the Paleocene-Eocene, really, that we start to see a large rise in animal mass. So as far as I know, and I wrote this paper with Mike Novacek and other people that do know, the largest mammal during the first 10 million years of the Cenozoic was on the order of a small cat. And then we start to see that massive increases in size in the Eocene all the way up until the middle of the Miocene, and actually even a little bit later. But this is, this is our oxygen reconstruction from the carbon isotope data. 
And we see these wiggles. I'm not going to go through what those are. But we see a general rise of oxygen, general rise, and then actually quite a large rise of oxygen in the Eocene, all the way through to the Oligocene. And it was up to about 24 to 23 to 24%, and then it goes down. Now, why is that important? It's important because we only did two things in mammals that were really, really different from what dinosaurs did. We have huge amounts of investment in body heat. That is a huge, huge calorie burner. And secondly, we gave rise to placentalism. Now, placentalism is not unique to mammals, but it is one, it is the major mode of our reproductive strategy. So mammals could now wander and didn't have to protect a nest specifically. They could wander and forage in larger, broader areas. Food supplies now could be distal from their local, local habitats. <clears throat> it has another advantage in that you not only don't have to protect a nest, but you could actually have a motile organism that you give birth to. Now, the rise of placental mammals occurs approximately at the Paleocene-Eocene boundary and a little bit later. Now, the second issue I want to discuss is this issue of size. And I just, I don't want to bore you, but I want to explain something to you. Mammal, mammal capillaries, in, our, our oxygen is distributed, obviously, by pipes. The pipes go down to very, 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 very small pipes, OK? Ultimately, every single muscle in our body is fed by one or two capillaries at very small scale. They scale inversely according to the size of the animal. So per unit muscle, a mouse has about 14 times higher capillary density than a cow. So it's much less diffusion limited. Why is that, does that matter? It matters because mammals, when they become placental, are serial Hold on, let me, I, I took those slides out. Mammals, when they become placental, the placenta is a serial breather. It is taking oxygen from around 30% of the, of the arterial blood supply to the placental manifold, and it is giving that to the fetus. So if you have low oxygen supply, low oxygen concentrations, you cannot be a large placental mammal. You can only be small. And we empirically know this in humans. If you go to the highest altitudes with low, not absolute oxygen concentration, but low oxygen tension, you'll see that the Tibetans, for example, they're relatively small and short people. The Bolivians are short people. You will never, it's not a dietary problem. It's an oxygen problem. Now, I'm not going to go into the biology of this. This was written, or you can read the paper if you want. Or it's a, you might say that's a just-so story. But it isn't just so in the fact that the oxygen concentrations are really, really, really important to uh, high evolutionary rates of mammals. And just to put this in perspective, you and I are what we call, I don't call it this, but it's actually been called, we're the hummers of the animal world compared to reptiles, which are like Volkswagen rabbits. Okay? So you can feed a chicken to a crocodile once a month and it'll be okay. It might still be hungry, but it'll be OK. Its dietary consumption of, of calories is low because its metabolic rate is low. Our dietary content, uh, caloric content of our food is, must be about 1,500 to 2,000 calories per day to maintain just basal metabolism. Now, that's a lot of, that's a lot of resource, which is why we, when Rick showed the, the plots yesterday, human beings have appropriated about 80% of all arable land on the planet. We actually appropriate 52% of all the net primary productivity on the planet at present. All right, now let's talk about humans for a minute. I don't know very much about humans. I've learned a lot in this discussion. This is from Sean Carroll's review several years ago in, in, in Nature. It's probably very dated for this audience, but it doesn't matter for the point I'm trying to make. <laughs> the point, I guess, that Sean was making and he knows more about developmental evolution than anybody else that I know of, is that these dots are not very well connected, as you know. So the question becomes, were there multiple, or was there a singular evolution of our species? Is there a, was there two nodes, three nodes, one node? How do we know? 
So can we trace the pattern of evolution in humans? And here I'm going to appeal to a paper, if you have never read it, by Zucker Candle and Pauling. Emil Zucker Candle is, was an amazing, amazing, actually he's still alive, I think he's 92. Amazing pianist as well. But Zucker Candle gave this idea to Linus Pauling, and they wrote a paper together in 1962, which becomes the basis of bioinformatics and the fundamental basis for how we use gene or protein sequences to trace the evolutionary tree of organisms, of any organism. So let's talk about this for a second. Can we use extracellular matrix protein sequences and mineralize fossils and use proteomics to sequence things? So I'm going to give you an example. I'm, I'm working on corals for the moment. I haven't thought about human teeth or bones or anything until I came here yesterday. This is a gene sequence. It's actually the amino acid sequence of a calcium carbonate binding protein in a coral. Now, this is one of 71 proteins for which we have the sequences. How did we get the sequences? Very simply, we took a coral, we dissolved away the skeleton with EDTA, that takes the calcium out, and then you're left with a matrix of the proteins. We take the proteins and we literally just run them on a gel and bring the gel over to the proteomics groups. They cut out the bands and they sequence it. And they tell us this. Now, at the same time, we have the gene sequences, which we have for humans, and so we can match the genes to these predicted protein sequences. And you could say, is this correct? And does it have a, a leader sequence, which would excrete it into the environment from the cells? And yes. Now, this particular sequence is very, very interesting sequence. It's very, very, very acidic. These are all aspartic acid residues, these Ds. OK? And there's a lot of glutamic acid residues, Es. <laughs> but this is a very, very unusual protein. There are sets of these proteins, and they bind calcium carbonate. And I want you to leave that for a minute. I'm going to come back to that. I, I, there must be sets of proteins like this in the formation of bone and teeth. There have to be, OK? So we, we know a lot about these, these proteins in humans, uh, but there is still a lot to be learned. But mutations, single mutations in these, can be brought back to Zucker, Candle, and Pauling's idea, and we can develop a phylogeny, potentially, of organisms from fossils using a proteomic sequence to connect the dots and see whether there were two or more nodes down here, and whether this tree followed this direction, and, or how did it go, OK? I'm just trying to give you an idea. I have no idea if it'll work, but it may. OK, so anyway. I'm going to finish up this, this idea. I want to talk about the evolution of speech for a minute, because that's another interesting set of protein. So humans have a complex communication capability. And that trait allowed us to rapidly communicate information without resorting to genetic selection. And that's really, really, really important. Really important. So if somebody eats something and makes them very sick, I can say, don't eat that thing. Or there's a, somebody out there that is very dangerous. Or, look, I made this tool. I'll show you how. Now, let me explain to you, because we're so unaware of this. Let me explain to you. I have in my hand a little laser diode pointer. How many of you know how to make a laser diode? You don't know how to make a laser diode? You know how to make a laser diode. Every, yeah, everybody knows how to make a laser diode. How many of you have flown in an airplane? So how many of you know how to make an airplane? Taro. <laughs> Great. Let me put it to you this way. We have a stochastic way of developing technologies where I don't say to you anymore, you, John, are the guy that is going to cut the rock to make a, a spear, OK? So you're John the spear maker. But many of our names come from guilds of professions, Miller. Carpenter, Smith. My name is Falkowski. The Falkowskis were a group of Polish knights that went around and were the falconers. OK? We were falconers. So we don't do that anymore because we have a structure of communication that allows us to, if somebody were to die that knows how to make an airplane, we still would know how to make an airplane. You'd Google it, right? <laughs> So horizontal information transfer is one of the most effective means 
of ensuring survival and success of a species. So this is probably one of the most important aspects of human evolution. Opposable thumbs, yes, that's important for building things. Walking upright, yes, but speech, really, really, really critical. So I would argue that speech potentially allowed humans to, ex to escape the red, red queen constraint, <clears throat> okay? That's, we're not killed off very often anymore. I want to talk a little bit about the biology of speech. I mentioned this yesterday, the Fox P2 gene. And I, I want to bring this up because there are several traits. And, and here's one. We can argue about whether or not uh, it's really, really important, but I think it is. It's, it's called the Fox P2 because it's, it's called this after this name. It's a four, forkhead box gene. It's located on chromosome 7, and this is the notation on the, the, the gene on that chromosome where it is. And it's a protein, I'll show it to you in a second, of 715 amino acids. And it's a transcription factor. What does that mean? It means during development, that gene tells other genes what to do, to go on and off, to express this way or that way. It patterns the production of your speech cords, of your entire speech recognition system in your brain. Mutations in this gene are mapped to many, many cases of autism. It's very, very, very famous gene. And that was discovered that way, actually, by the, a, 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 set of, a set of people in Britain <coughs> where some had mutations in this gene, in the Williams family it was, and they went on to get married. They were autistic, but went on to get married and had progeny. And so we exactly could map out this gene. Now, it contains this incredibly rich group of glutamines. Let me just show you this gene. Q's. Look at this. OK? This is, this is the, another very weird gene. So these, this is the amino acid sequence. And Q is the amino acid glutamine because we can't use G because G is already taken up for the amino acid glycine. But <clears throat> I'm just giving you, this is an idea. So this gene is also found in rodents and mice, but it's the, among the 5% most conserved proteins in human evolution. I'm pointing this out to you because very, very small mutations, very small mutations can lead to contingencies that lead to massive changes in behavior. Massive. You do not have to have any climate selection here. You just have just simply a normal random pattern on, of mutations. And if it happens to be on this gene, which was embedded in rodents 130 million years ago, that gene can give rise to a totally different dimension of behavior. So it occurred in humans. It was fixed in the last 200,000 years. And it's concomitant or subsequent to the emergence of the anatomically uh, modern humans. OK. All right, I'm not going to go into this. I want to just point this out again. And it leads to where Rick left off yesterday. So humans have massively altered biochemical and biological properties uh, on the planet. We have taken organisms from one place and put them in another place, at our convenience, at our whim. Gordon Orians would call this the, the last few hundred years of human history, the rearrangement of life. Humans have just rearranged anything they want. You want bougainvillea? Well, it grows in the Mediterranean. Take bougainvillea, put it in California. Put eucalyptus trees in Israel. You can do anything. Okay, you can put muskrats in Hawaii. It's just amazing. Okay, so but also, we have a very, very, very funny system here. We developed this concept of an economy, and this is a very old concept. I don't know where this evolved in human culture, but it's a very interesting one. So I live in Princeton. It's a very wealthy part of town. And I have squirrels in trees. Now, my squirrels do not pay chipmunks to go out and get nuts for them. <laughs> but we will pay somebody to do a service for us, right? So we don't actually have to make an airplane if we want to go fly. We don't have to make a seat. We have other skill sets, potentially. We don't have to make the laser dial. We pay somebody to do this. All right, so this, this issue of economy leads to 
power and accumulation of wealth. And when I'm talking about wealth, I'm talking about this organism, us. We have learned to plunder the planet very efficiently. So we're very different, and that's a singularity. No other organism does this. So this is driven, I would argue, and we can talk about it, the fear of death, which is a very, very old issue in all of the anthropological literature that I can understand, led to this concept that you don't really die. You don't die. You go somewhere. <laughs> or you come back as something else. But hardly any religion allows you to really die. Okay. So if you don't want to die, and you really want to have progeny that can be really stupid and ugly, but get married and have more stupid, ugly kids, then you could be wealthy. <laughs> OK? So I will give you examples of this. I mean, Paris Hilton is an example. She has no, no skills, but she's rich. OK? Now, she might have other problems, but the but so the acquisition of survival skills really, really doesn't matter very much if you accumulate wealth. So wealth provides a mechanism of ensuring progeny without skills. And I would argue <laughs> that this further exacerbates the resource plunder of the planet. OK? You know, it sounds funny, but it's not funny. It's not funny. When you go to China today, I was just in China last week. In Beijing, they're building, I mean, the, the national bird of China is a crane, but not the kind that flies, OK? If you go to China, they're building 40-story apartment houses, one after the, you can't count them. There's so many in Beijing. The apartments in them are two to three to four to five million dollars. And they're taken like this. So. <clears throat> This, this really has led to a very, very interesting disruption of natural biogeochemical cycles. So for example, that 0.01% of which only 0.01% became a fossil fuel, as oil, for example, of dead algae, we harvest that today very efficiently. So we can take out of the ground in one year, one million years worth of fossil fuel. We're one million times more efficient than nature. We're really smart. Really, really smart. OK? And of course, we just throw that up into the atmosphere. So you know, we can have this change in, in many, 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 many properties. So you can look at CO2, you can look at methane, you can look at nitrous oxide, and you can look at human beings, and they follow the same basic curve. So up until about 1900, 1900, the population, does anybody know the population in the year 1900 of the planet? was about 990 million people. We ended the century at 6 billion. There were two innovations, lateral, gene tra lateral information transfer systems, that allowed this to occur. One was the Brits, when they went everywhere, they built good sewage systems. So clean water, civil engineers allowed clean water and removal of sewage to away from the clean water system. Now, that was really interesting, because if you ever go to Philadelphia, and you go, Benjamin Franklin was arguably the smartest person in this country at the end of the 19th century, of the 18th century. If you go to the back of Benjamin Franklin's house, which is right off of Main Street near the, the post office, right next to the post office, you'll go back out and you'll see there's a hole which is covered. It's called Benjamin Franklin's Well. And right next to it is a hole which says Benjamin Franklin's Privy. Until the discovery of the germ theories by Koch, we did not really understand that the transmission of disease was by microbes. But once that was discovered, we built very, very, very rapidly clean water systems and toilets and so on, and the population was no longer going to die before five years old of cholera or dysentery or some other in inherit uh, uh, communicable disease. So the, fe the feces to oral route was the major mode of, was a major mode of, mode of death of children for forever in the back. The second issue was then the invention, obviously, of medicines. So most of us have taken an antibiotic. Most of us have had some other medical treatment, which has allowed our germ cells to continue on. All right, now obviously, we're 
doing a lot of things. I know I'm just going very quickly through this because I don't want to bore you. But you know, obviously, we're, we're, we've left the worst case scenarios for the IPCC report for carbon dioxide emissions because we're so good at plundering the planet. Now, we've plundered many, many, many elements. So carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, water, as, as Rick mentioned yesterday, we have huge, 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 huge signals for this. Um, so these, these graphs were used by the third IPCC report. Uh, they're being updated now. They're from a paper I wrote in 2001. Uh, and it, it's phenomenal how smart we are. Now I'm going to finish off. Somebody mentioned we don't know much about extinctions, and we didn't think about extinctions. The normal faunal turnover, the normal faunal turnover is on the order of about three to four, five million years, depending on the the the, uh, the group of organisms. But we've had five major extinction events uh, over the last uh, five, 540 million years. So <clears throat> the end of the Ordovician. Here you see the Devonian extinction, uh, the the big the big one here at the Permian, for which we don't have a good cause. Uh, the Triassic-Jurassic extinction, which uh, ended <coughs> at 200 and exactly 200 million years ago, and of course the KT boundary. Now, I would argue that we're in for another extinction event, that human beings are plundering this planet, and this will be uh, another minor perturbation in a way, uh, but it will be um, something that I want to just discuss in one second. I'll finish this up in a second, Peter. <coughs> so I put this as just an old graph of, 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 of glacial interglacial cycles. And here, watch this. This is the methane signal. So during interglacials, methane goes up, and during glacial period, it goes down. Why is that? This is soil moisture. You're looking at microbes that are mobilizing peats and other organic matters in anaerobic systems and soils and putting it into the atmosphere during interglacial times and not being able to do that very much because of either aridity or because they're in frozen soils during glacial times. So here's an example of modification of the climate with a greenhouse gas by microbes. The carbon dioxide is similarly modified. Essentially, we take carbon from the uh, high latitude alpine forests. We remove them with glaciers coming in, removes the forests. The carbon dioxide is released to the atmosphere. The, the atmosphere becomes a temporary hallway or conduit, and the carbon dioxide goes into the ocean. It comes back out of the ocean during the interglacials, goes back up onto the land to the temporary storage systems of trees and, and soils. So that is a dynamic which is played out by glacial interglacial cycles every 100,000 years now. And we could go on and on. We could do nitrous oxide. Essentially, we get locked into the last few hundred thousand years in this attractor mode, which is very, very, very stable. So we're talking about little vibrations here in the, the, the middle of the Miocene or in the Pliocene. But really, for very long periods of time, this has been relatively stable. Now we're pushing this. We're at 385 ppm CO2, somewhere up here. And we have not reached thermal equilibrium, which would be way over here somewhere. So the Earth is fundamentally a bottom-up system where, in which microbes have adapted for billions of years to maintain a quasi-steady state. Humans, through efficient resource plunder, will modify the Earth's atmosphere and climate, but microbes will easily survive. So animals and some plants are extremely vulnerable to human activities, and many species probably will go extinct in this century. That's true. But humans are very poor stewards of the planet. So this is really what we have become. We have altered the planetary climate system and are doing it continuously. The guys that are going to take care of it are the guys you can't see. So you can't plant enough trees, believe me. So I'm going to leave it with this thought. This is Charles Lyell in Principles of Geology when he was discussing the concept of why there were fossil marine organisms in the Alps. And somebody thought that, well, maybe there was a huge ejection of volcanic organisms up onto land. Another thought, that this was the relic of the great flood, that when God pulled the plug somehow, the water went down and you were left with this exposed mountains full of dead fossil organisms. Another thought, God made rocks to look like other organisms to 
test your faith. And Lyell, being a barrister, he was trained as a lawyer. He wrote, the system of scholastic disputations encouraged in the universities of the Middle Ages had unfortunately trained men to habits of indefinite argumentation, and they often preferred absurd and extravagant propositions because greater skill was required to maintain them, the end and object of such intellectual combats being victory and not the truth. And that may seem archaic, but that is exactly the way it is going down in Tennessee and in our Congress. There is not a single Republican presidential candidate that will admit to evolution or climate change. Not one. And they're smart. In fact, some of them went to Harvard. So thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you.